stand on the shores of eternity, stand in silence and listen to the rhythmic rhyming chimes of time. Close your eyes and see the mossed and whitened stones of infinity. Speak with lips of tranquility, of a love divine. Inhale the scent of history as you stand on the shores of eternity. Welcome to Loch Gur, a site of international significance due to the rich archaeology and environment that is found here. Loch Gur is located in the southwest of Ireland, just 21 kilometres southeast of Limerick City. The monuments that you will see on this virtual tour today are cared for by the Office of Public Works and the National Monument Service. The Lake of Loch Gur and the Amenity area are cared for and owned by Limerick City and County Council while visitor attractions and facilities on site are managed by Locker Development, a not-for-profit society. Together, we work in tandem to protect and preserve Locker for present and future generations. To set the site in context, local authority archaeologist Sarah McCutcheon from Limerick City and County Council will set the scene. As Kate has said, uh, Locker is an internationally archaeologically important landscape. Of the four townlands that touch on the shores of the lake, there is over 200 monuments dating from Neolithic times through to the late medieval and more are being found all the time. And this wonderful array continues right up to the modern vernacular. So in fact in this small area we have six millennia of man's impact on the landscape, which is truly unique. These sites have a very broad range, incorporating ceremonial, domestic and agricultural sites. The quality, range, diversity and visibility of these monuments, set in such a well-preserved landscape, make Loch Gur almost unique. The Neolithic period in Ireland dates from 4000 BC and is best represented in Loch Gur by the extensive settlement on Nockadoon, which has indicated dates as early as 3600 BC. This site was also in use as a settlement in the Bronze Age, which dates from 2500 to 500 BC. Similar in length of use is the most well-known site in Loch Gur, Grangestone Circle. The circle was part of a much larger ceremonial landscape on the western shore of the lake that originally included another stone circle even larger than the surviving example. The early medieval era dates from 400 to 800 AD and it is at that time that the stone forts on Carrigalia were built as well as the more humble houses at the Spectacles. Loch Gur boasts of three medieval castles in the immediate vicinity of the lake two possibly 13th century and a later majestic tower house, Boucher's Castle, a favoured seat of the Earls of Desmond. This brings us right up to the 19th century with the renowned book The Farm by Loch Gur, which recounts the lifestyle of the middle-class Catholic tenant farmer set against the backdrop of the landscape and legends of Loch Gur. Loch Gur has attracted antiquarians, archaeologists and authors for hundreds of years. In 2018, Locker was privileged to add two more important books to its already impressive tally. Rose Cleary's seminal work, The Archaeology of Locker, gathering all of the information gleaned from new research and from previous excavations. And inspired by the late Michael Quinlan, This is Locker, a compendium of stories, songs and folklore. Limerick City and County Council is very conscious of its duty of care to such a special place and was happy to assist in both publications. The best custodians, however, are those who live here, some for many generations. And it is with several of these that you will be guided in the following segments as you share their personal accounts of the monuments. And I hope it will inspire you to visit in the future. In 1996, the Loch Gur Tour Guides was established by the late Michael Quinlan. This virtual tour includes some of these guides who will share a brief overview of the history, archaeology and folklore associated with these sites. To start the tour, we will visit the famous Great Grange Stone Circle to meet Mary O'Grady. Welcome to Grange Stone Circle. 
This is the largest and the finest stone circle in Ireland. It was built about 5,000 years ago, which dates it to the Neolithic period. It is unusual in Irish stone circles as there is an earthen bank on the outside of the ring of standing stones. It seems that this earthen bank was constructed about 500 years before the stones were erected inside the circle. The circle consists of 113 standing stones, which is more than any stone circle in either Ireland or the UK, and it is over 45 metres in diameter. The interior of the circle is just under one acre in size. There are 12 very large standing stones, the largest of which is Ronak Crum Dove. This stone is over four metres high and is reported to weigh 40 tonnes. Imagine the effort required to quarry such an enormous stone, bring it to the site and then raise it into the standing position where it has remained for over 5,000 years. The community which undertook such a task must have been very large and well organised to be able to provide the required manpower. Because this circle is almost a perfect circle, each of the stones had to be precisely placed into position. The circle has a clearly defined entrance and opposite the entrance are the V-stones. Local tradition has it that this circle is aligned on the summer solstice. The rising sun on June 21st shines through the entrance and then through the V-stones. There are a number of other circles and standing stones in the fields nearby and it is suggested that these may have formed some sort of larger astronomical calendar. There is also some suggestion that the circle is built on ley lines or energy lines. And it is said that if one stands at a stone, particularly the largest stone, Ronach Crum Dove, and places one's palms and forehead on the stone, the energy will be felt. This circle was certainly built for ceremonial purposes and there was no evidence of human habitation found during excavation. It was certainly the cathedral of its day. Of course, folklore attributes magical powers to the circle as well. One story goes that a local man who always wanted to be a musician, but he failed to do so despite his best efforts. One day he went to Limerick to purchase a musical instrument and on his way home, he felt tired and went into the circle to have a rest. He fell asleep and didn't wake for three days. But when he returned to Loch Gore three days later, he was the best musician ever heard in the area. As we drive towards the lake, our next stop is Champel Nua, our new church, where George Finch will give us some more information. So welcome to Champel Nua, our new church. Let us look across the lake at the hill of Knockadoon. Knockadoon, the fortified hill, was where 6,000 years ago the first Neolithic farmers came and settled on the hill. This was 1,000 years before the Great Stone Circle was built at Grange. This was a thriving community. Where they built, yes, their stone houses, rectangular and circular. These rectangular houses were very well constructed. Their architectural features included a cavity wall, cavity insulated walls, and a damp proof course. And in fact, the visitor centre at Loch Gore is modelled on those structures. Returning now to Champel Nua, this was originally built as a chapel of ease for the Catholic Desmonds. However, after the lands at Loch Gore came into the possession of Sir George Boucher, it was repurposed for Anglican worship in the 1600s. In fact, Rachel, the Countess Dowger of Bath, bestowed a chalice and pattern for use in the church in 1679. A replica is on display at the visitor centre. During the penal laws, Catholics were forbidden to attend religious services, but they held Mass secretly outdoors. In Loch Gor here, Mass was celebrated at the Mass Rock, directly opposite Champel Nua. The roof of the church had collapsed by 1803, but in the early 20th century, Count Azalis, the landlord at that time, organised to have a copper roof of a church in Italy shipped to Ireland with the intention of replacing the roof here in Newchurch. Unfortunately, the ship carrying the roof was torpedoed 
and the copper roof destined for new church now lies at the bottom of the sea. The graveyard around the church contains the remains of Catholics, while the Protestant burials were inside the church. The oldest headstone is for Garrett Chenners, who died in 1749. It is said that Thomas O'Connell, a famous 17th century composer and harpist, is also buried here in an unmarked grave. On the night that he died in 1698, he was entertaining in Bouchers Castle, Nakadoon, and then he rested by the fire. When he was called upon to play again, it was found that he had died. A great crowd attended his funeral in Champel Newa, and the banshee's wail was heard coming from Corriganuller and Nakadoon. Thomas O'Connell is immortalised in local poet own Bresnan's song, Champel Newa. Meet that high and hoary gable, which defies the rack of time, sleeps O'Connell beside the shining wave. And those who loved his Irish melodies, enchanting and sublime, should raise a wreath of laurels o'er his grave. Sweet Champel, no, where our tears so freely flow, or the graves of those who nursed us long ago. May the heavens smile upon them, and their choicest gifts bestow on the graves of thy love sleepers, Champel, no. We are now going to visit the giant's grave or megalithic tomb. When you look at its size, you can understand why people thought that a giant was buried here, as it is over eight metres long and three metres wide. However, it is a tomb that was once used to bury Neolithic chieftains from the community living on Nakadoon, that George referred to earlier. So let us meet Tom Lynch now as he describes this site. Welcome to the Loch Gore Wedge tomb, known locally as the Giant's Grave. This site was first used in 2500 BC, which places it in the late Neolithic era and was in constant use right through to the uh, Bronze Age, which was 1600 BC. During this period, there were four different types of burials in Ireland. You had the, the Dolmen, Cork Cairn, Passage Tombs and Wedge Tombs. A third of all burials were Wedge Tombs, of which this is a particularly fine example. Specifically, it is a wedge-shaped gallery grave consisting of a long gallery with a double walling and rubble between. This is divided into two chambers. The tomb faces west, large capstone rested on the side walls and were originally covered with a cairn of stones which contained a porthole. The belief was that this allowed the spirit of the person to move freely from the tomb. The Irish custom of opening a window in a room where someone dies to allow the spirit to leave mirrors this belief. The giant's grave was excavated in 1938 by Sean P. O'Reardon and Garrod O'Hockeda. Fragmented bone remains of eight adults and four children were found. Different types of pottery were also found in the tomb, indicating the use of urns. But these were probably filled with food for the afterlife. The presence of human bones in the tomb suggests that the remains were not cremated. Unusually, the skeleton of a full ox with his head bent backwards was found to the south of the tomb. This may have been a sacrificial offering. In Ireland, these sites are often associated with the fairy folk or the little people. And in a field behind the tomb, there is a rock called Carrigunahig. And legend has it that Don Fierna, the king of the fairies, who lived in Knock Fierna, just outside Ballingarry, um, was very upset with the fairies of Loch Gore because they were forever telling lies and causing mischief and doing tricks on people. So one day he got very angry with them and he picked up a rock from Knock Fierna, the Hill of Truth, and he threw it 10 miles through the air to smash the fairies in Loch Gore. Now, luckily for them, they were able to hide in Carrig on Afrin, the mass rock, 
and so escape the wrath of Don Fierna. Our next stop is Carrigal, where we will find two early Christian ring forts that were in use from 700 to 1000 AD and were possibly occupied by a chieftain, his family and servants. Anya Barry will give us more information. Welcome to the early Christian ring forts of Carrigal. These were really impressive defensive fortresses with walls approximately three metres high, which were reached by a series of steps. And on top of the wall, there was a wooden fence. The wall was one metre in diameter, which was easily patrolled by sentries and offered a commanding view of the surrounding countryside. In fact, on a clear day, you can see most of County Limerick and mountains into County Cork, County Tipperary and County Clare. Looking at the entrance here, you will see a recess where a wooden gate hung. And on the ground, there are two distinct surfaces in use. One side was for cobbled for the animals to come in and out, and one was paved for people. Cattle were the mainstay of the economy back then, and there was a lot of cattle stealing going on. So every night, the cattle came back into the fortress for protection, and during the day, they grazed the surrounding hillside. The paved path led to a number of houses inside the fortress, and these were probably rectangular in use because it made for easier division. When they excavated here, they found a number of things. There were some bronze ring brooches, enameled hand pins, drinking mounts, but the most famous find of all was a cache of Viking silver, which probably resulted as a canny trade agreement between the people who lived here and the Vikings of Limerick. Carrigal 1 then isn't as well preserved. In fact, when Professor Sean Pio Reardon excavated it, he called it a slovenly dwelling. And it was probably therefore in use by soldiers and servants. It overlooks a marshy area, and it was in this area that the bronze shield of Lochgar was found by the Hayes brothers in 1872. They were out cutting reeds to thatch, and they stopped to take their lunch and decided to play a game of long jump. One of the boys ran and jumped, and where he landed, his brother marked it on the ground with his sickle. Then it was his turn to run and jump, and luckily for us, he landed in more or less the same spot. When his brother marked it on the ground with the sickle, the sickle got stuck. When he went to pull it out, he heard a metallic noise, and then they uncovered the earth and found this magnificent bronze shield. There is a replica, which can be seen in the visitor centre, and the original hangs in the National Museum in Kildare Street, and still has the two sickle marks which the brothers made. Finally, if you look over my right shoulder, you will see a little road leading into the bog. And this led to the Fitzgerald family homestead. In 1793, James Fitzgerald married Henora McCarthy and they moved to Brough. Their son, Thomas Fitzgerald, emigrated to America. And his son was John Francis Fitzgerald, known as Honey Fitz, who later became mayor of Boston. Honey Fitz was the grandfather of President John F. Kennedy, the 35th President of the United States of America. If you visit Brough, you can go to the Thomas Fitzgerald Centre, where you will learn more about the connection, and you can see a statue to President John F. Kennedy. And now we arrive at the lakefront of Loch Gur, a place of great natural beauty, and registered as a wildfowl sanctuary by the National Parks and Wildlife Service. Our next guide is Tom Tierney. Loch Gor, it is a charming place where strangers come to view. The romantic hills and valleys fair and the sunny waters blue. Where Desmond rides his enchanted steed o'er the shimmering waters wide. Oh, I'd long to stray with that maid so fair down by sweet Loch side. So that's a verse of the Maid of Loch Gore, a song which was written by the noted poet and historian Owen Breslin, who lived in Loch Gore at the turn of the last century. So welcome to Sweet Loch Gore Side. For over 6,000 years, people have been living, working and visiting this area. And they not only have left us with their monuments, but also with their folklore, songs and legends. The lake is surrounded by hills, which gives the most amazing dark skies at night. To my right, you can see Knock Fennel, 
In Mary Carberry's book, The Farm by Loch Gore, she describes this as a hollow hill and home to the fairies. In fact, if you venture into the hill, the fairies will cast a spell on you by blowing dandelion seeds in your eyes so that you cannot see, stuffing your ears with elder pits so you cannot hear, and then feeding you with swallow meat. Once you eat this, you will become immortal and join the fairy realm. Opposite Knockfinnel, on the left is Knockadoon, which is where the Neolithic farmers settled. On Knockadoon is the Cave of the Echoes, which is reputed to be the entrance to Tiernan Og, the land of eternal youth. And of course, legend has it that there is a city underneath the lake where Garod Irla lives because of a magic spell. He is allowed up once every seven years to ride his horse around the lake. The horse is shod with silver shoes and Garod is destined to continue this until the silver shoes are no more. Looking across the water here, we can see Bolan Island, which is a cranog or man-made island which was in use in the early Christian period. Bolan Island was possibly home to a goldsmith as a gold inlay arrow was found, was found there during excavations. The island was reached by boat or by a series of underwater steps, which was known only to those who were involved in building it. Originally, there were five cranogs on Loch Gore, but when the level of the lake was lowered in the 1840s, these were subsumed back into the surrounding landscape. Behind Bolan Island, you can see Boutras Castle. This was originally built in the 15th century by the Earls of Desmond and was called Loch Gore Castle. However, the Earls of Desmond lost their lands and titles when they rebelled against Elizabeth I in the late 16th century and their castle and lands were granted to Sir George Boucher, hence the name Boucher's Castle. In 1641, the castle was under siege for 24 weeks as the Irish, led by Lord Castle Connell, attempted to gain control. They were successful, but over 80 people lost their lives. So here we are by the lake shore and what we see here on our right is the lime kiln. The lime kiln was in operation back in the 1800s and basically was where limestone was burnt and converted into quick lime, which was then used as fertilizer on the land or uh, as disinfectant or even as whitewash mortar to put on the stone buildings. After the lime kiln, we come to the wishing seat, which is a stone seat. And the story goes that if two people sit on that seat and make a wish, then they never will be parted. And when they come back to Loch Gore, is still there. So it's part of the folklore of Loch Gore. Beyond the wishing seat then we come to the steps which takes us up to the heritage centre and here you will meet Siobhan and Siobhan will explain to you what Loch Gore has to offer for children. Welcome to Loch Gore Visitor Centre. It was built in 1981. It is based on the Neolithic houses found on Loch the rectangular building houses the interpretive centre, while the circular building houses a shop. And in the shop, we have teas, coffees, ice cream, and we have a selection of books, including The Farm by Locker and This is Locker. When you enter the interpretive centre, you will see the timeline, which dates each site that you will see in Locker. Now, the centre is quite interactive with a mixture of touch screens and listening devices, which will give you more information about each of the historical sites in the area. The centre is also very child friendly. You will see here that there is a broken pot, which children have to piece together again. When an archaeologist finds a piece of pottery during an excavation, they will have to piece it together in the same way. Another place which is very interesting for children is the mini archaeological dig. Then we have the dress up section, where the adults and the children can dress up in medieval costumes which would have been worn in the area around the 15th and 16th centuries. Children can also get worksheets to take through the interpretive centre with them, where there are a series of questions to answer based on information which we'll find in the centre. There is also audio guides that you can take outdoors to listen to. There is tracks on them audio guides. I think there's 15. 10 of these feature the folklore of the area. Outside the doors of the visitor centre we have our Salsas Park which is a playground with plenty of seating to keep an eye on the smallies. In the playground while taking in the magnificent view of the lake. If you go back out the gate at the visitor centre you will come to a hundred steps that lead to the viewing point. And directly behind this is a fairy village. Don't forget to look up and see the fairies in the trees as well as the fairy doors on the ground. 
Black Gower is home to all 22 native Irish trees. Each tree is marked with an information panel and you can pick up a map in the visitor centre to try and find all of the 22 trees. There is even a tricky tree trivia quiz on the map to keep the children occupied as you walk around the grounds. There is lots and lots to do for both children and adults in Lockerr. We have the playground and of course we have the interpretive centre. We have the fairy trail and we have the tree trail. Also, you could bring a picnic, kick a football. There is lots to do or just walk around. It's a lovely place to bring the family for the afternoon. Stand on the shores of eternity. Stand in silence and listen to the rhythmic rhyming chimes of time. Close your eyes and see the mossed and whitened stones of infinity. Speak with lips of tranquility, of a love divine. Inhale the scent of history as you stand on the shores of eternity. And so we have reached the end of this Locker virtual tour. You can clearly see that the Loch Gur tour guides are very passionate about sharing the history, archaeology and folklore associated with this site. When you can visit with us, you can book your tour direct on lochgur.com. The Loch Gur tour guides look forward to meeting you then.